Yeah, that's correct. I'm sorry. I by ignorance, I, I thought you had a background. Thank you. Well, well to be here. Yeah, I didn't see any uh, AIC uh, in your video. Mostly, I was just uh, entertained by the uh, the, the intercockpit communications between you all. <laughs> so, like <laughs> the the, uh, the uh, basically the flight regiments you're trying to get yourself into and out of that kind of thing. It, it's pretty good. Yeah, okay. Bye. Well, Creighton, if you want, uh, I can I can populate a little bit more information on uh, that month where you did. And I know that I sent my uh, my resume to you on uh, a box. So my fat thumbs may have mistyped, but I was actually commissioned in 87. And well, I may have mistyped that, you know. Uh, but um, by 89, I had uh, I was already stationed in Okinawa as the air support control officer. Uh, so air support control, um, one way, something that's kind of unique about it is it's called procedural control and not positive control. So when you all deal with an AWACS or a uh, ground control intercepts, you know, or, or, you know, basically people who are providing the picture, you know, big picture for you outside the, the uh, scan volume of your own radar, um, that's called positive control. Okay. They can give you specific directions, headings, and altitude. Procedural control is more of a flow control. We can stack people check in, uh, basically what you're doing as a fire, you know, uh, as an air, you know, air control officer is you're embedded in the fire support coordination center of whatever level, uh, ground component command is out there. So something that I think kind of 
ties all this together is every piece of marine aviation is to support one thing, and that's the trigger puller. Okay. So a Hornet is basically a flying piece of artillery, you know, when it comes to the ground uh, component. Uh, that's all we, that's the main mission. All the other stuff above and beyond that is extra, you know, that's, uh, you know, what do you call them? Uh, the extra credit or, uh, you know, electives, <laughs> if you will. Okay. So the Marines going to Top Gun is, is kind of like a, okay, well, you got to have a training officer, you know, uh, at every squadron. And so basically your pilot training officer has to go through that syllabus. But on the air support side, as a, even though I was in the wing, you're out there with the grunts, you're digging foxholes, and you're setting up your communications equipment, and then you uh, form uh, what's called a fire support coordination center, which is the fixed wing, the rotary wing, the artillery, naval gunfire, uh, if you're in in and close to the littorals, uh, obviously within range of naval gunfire. Uh, and the artillery includes down to mortars and everything. So essentially, the ground component commander, whether he's Italian, regimental vision commander, can just go to his fire support coordination center and say, I want to shift my focus from objective A to objective B, and we're right there with the radios to start pushing uh, aircraft uh, to the forward air controllers. So that, that's the last link, the fire sport coordination center, that last link to the individual ground units where embedded in there is your fire, you know, basically your forward air controller. Okay. Uh, that went through a lot of evolution while I was in the Marine Corps, uh, went from Marines only to now it's like a JTAC as they call them, basically, uh, all services. So they can uh, they can cross breed if they want to, but they're all, everybody's training was standardized. So that was essentially my job there. And then uh, I had always uh, wanted to get into aviation, but uh, you know, being commissioned in '87, the year before, there was this movie that came out. Okay, and uh, yeah, it had this guy in there, and I think he showed up you know, what, 30 years late in, a, in the same, you know, the sequel. Well, get this, going down to a recruiter. So I was finishing up college and I started walking into the different recruiters down, uh, you know, near the school. And when that, when that first Top Gun movie came out, the waiting list just to get in to the commissioning programs was, you know, out the door and around the block. I mean, it's, Everybody and their mother wanted to be a fighter pilot. Okay. So you walk into the Navy and they say, well, you got to have a 3.9 GPA and, uh, you know, engineering or something like this, uh, as well as pass all the physical standards. That's just to even have them look at you. Air Force was like, yeah, you got to have a 4.0 in math or something. Uh, the Marine Corps was like, hey, if you got a steady pulse on a thick neck, come on in, you know. And so they took us, you know, took me, you know, because I was just your average, I was a B student and I wasn't going to knock anybody's socks off, you know, with the test scores or anything like that. So uh ended up joining the Marines and their waiting list, of course, was long on the aviation side, but they said, heck, we'll take you in anyway. And I said, great, sounds good. So that's where I went. Uh, so I'd always wanted to be an aviator. So all along, while I'm an air sport control officer, I kept dropping letters uh, up the chain commands requesting collateral moves and kept getting rejected every six months. You know, like clocker, drop a letter, a month later, get word back. You know, we regret to inform you that due to the keen nature of the competition, you're not, you know, you're not going to get it. That's fine. And I did that. And then, um, we got sent over to Saudi Arabia for, you know, the giant kitty litter box, uh, Kabuki theater that goes on over there, uh, into desert shield and then desert storm. Uh, and that was an interesting, there was a lot of interesting lesson word on that, but, uh, basically attached ourselves to the first Marine division under general Wyatt 
to the fire sport coordination center at the division club where I was. Um, a sidebar note on that, when we first got there, all the MPS shipping was offloading. Okay. And we're getting fresh new equipment, unwrapping the aluminum foil off of everything, at radios, Humvees, you know, you name it. And the uh, 7th Marine Regiment was out there. Uh, and literally, this was the most fun I've had to, as a young lieutenant. Uh, my captain comes to me because I'm just a, you know, I'm a first lieutenant at the time. He goes, you know, Lieutenant O'Donnell, get Sergeant Snyder, grab a home B, get some radios, and go out into the desert and find 7th Marine uh, Regiment headquarters. <laughs> and they're out there with their armored vehicles and ham, you know, and got everything. Up. So uh, we went out there and we're just a uh, little, and I end up grabbing one of the Lance buckles to do new battery repair to radios. And we just went blazing out in the middle of the sand in Saudi Arabia. And we ended up finding them and uh, linked up with them and then setting up a little quick, you know, communication site for them just so we had a, a, an element of aviation uh, representing there. You, you know, like I said, even though we're brown guys, you know, we're part like, well, we're there, help it. And uh, that was fun uh, going out there catching scorpions and that kind of stuff, dodging camels on the roads and everything. So, uh, but anyway, did that. And then I got back. And uh, one of the big competition things, if you think of Top Gun for the Navy, uh, the Marine Corps has an equivalent in the aviation world, and that's WTI. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Weapons and Tactics Instructor is a uh, kind of the the patch that you get to wear instead of a Top Gun patch to wear a WTI patch. Uh, yeah, there was just a documentary on Fox, I think it was, right? Tex? Yeah, about WTI. It was, it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Effect, you know, effectively, WTI just, uh, I think my dad asked me when I got back, he said, what do they teach you there? And I said, ah, how to... You know, kill people and break things with better efficient. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, anyway, that was kind of the, the thing to, if you could get a WTI in your community, uh, that was like sought after. Well, you know, I was, I was in the mix. I was in the running for it. And I ended up coming in number two to go to WTI. Because once you become a WTI, you're now stuck back in the squadron uh, as, you know, in the air support squadron for at least another year because now you're the training officer to teach all the other guys, you know, what, you know, what's the latest and greatest WTIs teach at Paulista. So I was number two and I didn't, you know, but the commanding officer and the executive officer, they make their decision, all right, all right, we're going to take lieutenant so-and-so. Well, Lieutenant so-and-so decided he wanted to get married, and the wedding date was right there in the middle of WTI. And they, the, basically, the, I think the XO said, all right, he's out. No figure in. Heck, so, boom, I go to WTI. While I'm at WTI, I get accepted to go to flight speed. So all that time they put in all that effort to get me to go to WTI, to you know, wear that patch, and then I leave. I got orders to get out of there. Be this to say, the commanding officer was not happy. They could have the door was the go con. I pulled a quick one on him, and then off I go. It's kind of cooler, and then start my uh, my you know journey in through T thirty four mentor T two Buckeyes. We were still flying those, and the uh, A four uh, Sky. Well, to basically that's beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And then after that, uh, got selected for Hornets and then off the El Toro. So kind of, that kind of fills in a lot of blanks up through 95 there, you know. <laughs> do, you, do you feel like, go ahead. I was going to say, do you feel like that experience before you got to flight school kind of gave you any sort of advantage over maybe someone coming straight out of college or something? Um, as, as far as stick and rudder skills uh, as an aviator, no, uh, because it's 
the military, as far as, you know, my experience with the Navy and the Marine Corps all go through the same pipeline and they don't care if you've got 13,000 hours in, you know, some kind of turbo prop aircraft, they're going to start you from ground zero and they're going to teach you the way they wanted, want you to do it. And that's that. Uh, we had some guys who had every riddle experience, uh, uh, some guys who had, you know, previous flight time, uh, make, make it care less. You know, you may do that to try to get your foot in the door. And then after, once your foot's in the door, they're going to say, okay, everything you've learned up to this point is for death because it's, you know, probably not good. And he wants you to learn it our way. Uh, but the only experience it did give me is a real good uh, appreciation for how the uh, workings, all the sausage making that goes on just to get a plane on target and talking to a fact, a Ford Air Couture, uh, a, an um, a enormous amount of support goes in to make that happen. And so I, I really gained a lot of knowledge and a good appreciation on that aspect of me. That's the A4 roll crazy fast in real life as well. We've got a, a sort of cheap imitation of it in DCS and it rolls like instantly. You can knock your pilot out actually in the game by just rolling. <laughs> yeah, the uh, one of the things on uh, uh, speaking of aileron, you're talking aileron roll. Okay. Yeah, the uh, the A4 Skyhawk that little wing uh, that little delta wing uh, can roll at 720 degrees a second. Um, and so they discouraged you from exceeding 360 degrees. Because really there's no need tactically to do greater, at, you know, the Blue Angels and, you know, Thunderbirds, they can do all that fancy stuff. The planes have been modified. You could not, uh, I don't know how accurate DCS is, in the Hornet, if you start rolling aggressively uh, at certain airspeeds, you get a what's called a Dutch roll. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where your nose starts to, uh, you know, increase a helix pattern, and then you will depart the airplane. And uh, intentionally departing the uh, Hornet uh, got you a, a one-way uh, visit to the general's office. You know, and it wasn't fun. Yes, we have. We we do. It is actually simulated in in the Hornet there, but mm -hmm. uh, but Hornet is a sort of official product, if you like. Whereas the A four is a it is a sort of modded, you know, community uh, creation, uh, and and um, yeah, truly, it does roll as fast as you just described. It. Oh yeah, yeah. Now, whether you can knock yourself out, I don't know. Maybe if you uh, you know, smack your head in the canopy and the inside, uh, something that. Uh, uh, I almost took myself out, uh, not taking myself out like that, uh, conscious wise. I was, I remember when I was, uh, early in my Hornet career, one of the things that you're doing is, uh, when you're learning defensive basic fighter maneuver, it takes a lot of time. You're just doing this thing like this, you're over your shoulder. Hey, looking so that puts a lot of strain because, you know, you got this. 10 pound head that's seven and um, you know, 56 pounds. So what you end up doing is you just put the, you know, once you break away and there's no longer a, a infrared threat from a, you know, IR seeking missile, you can relight your afterburner and then take your hand off the throttle. And now you put it up on the towel rack, which is, you know, one of the little handles up there. And then you're, you know, that's what's your, you know, left hand, right hands on the control step. And now you can, you know, then you're, Get a detention in trying to fight this guy off. And then one time was going to point up and start climbing and I couldn't be full of hitting off the G's. My head was stuck between the headrest and the, and the canopy. My helmet was stuck. And I'm trying to pull my head and I can't. And, and because of the way it got wedged up in there. So what I had to do is go back and put Max G back on the airplane which made no tactical sense in the fight. But then I could uh, get my head back out underneath there. And I said, all right, I'm never doing that again. But I looked out scared me. I got my attention. 
my neck was sore the next day. That's, that's for sure. A lot of our guys fly in VR, which which uh, at least adds that kind of strain on your neck. It doesn't quite add the Gs, but it does it does give you a one to one rotation. Whereas those of us like me or or Creighton who fly on street, there is a uh, there's a meeting. Um... There we go. Um, yeah, uh, for for those of us who fly on on screens, we have a bit more of a. Um, uh, you know, compression on that movement. So we, we just rotate our head a little bit. So in a BFM fight uh, or in a BFM scenario, you know, people like Tex are there like literally wrenching their head out, you know, for two hours on end or, or whatever, just, just minus the G's. Right. Yeah. Right. And we, yeah. and, and we look at the edge of our, of our monitor. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. So this, yeah, the DCS is pretty neat. There's some, uh, I'm kind of impressed with, so are the uh, level of detail, on uh, uh, even the the threat. You know, the enemy uh, aircraft. To, you know, for example, you know all the stuff on MIGs. You know, everything else out there. It's, it's pretty impressive. But like, okay, it, it's mostly because it actually comes from uh, many many years ago, like twenty plus years ago. There was another series that this uh, the original manufacturer made, which which was called Lock On. Uh, and that was actually produced um, with Russian aircraft in mind. Actually, was produced in Russia. Um, so, so the company as it is now is, is basically nothing it, like it was before. But the original material is still there. So, actually, their first their first uh, aircraft were MiG twenty nine, SU twenty seven, SU thirty three, and the Eagle uh, and the A ten, of course. I was. All right, uh, let's go ahead and uh, answer this first question I had. What is AMMO? Oh, double AMO. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the Assistant AV, uh, Aircraft Maintenance Officer. So the Aircraft Maintenance Officer uh, answers to the CO, Manning Officer, with all things related to maintenance. Uh, so basically, you, you, you know, depending on your career path, uh, you, you touch as double AMO and then maybe you go, uh, I remember one of our AMOs in our squadron was actually a, uh, one of the test pilots for McDonnell Douglas back when McDonnell Douglas existed. And so he basically lived back in the St. Louis area. And every time a, a fresh warrant came out of the factory door, he hopped in it and took it for a test in. And so he was right there at the manufacturing level, so he got to learn a whole bunch about the maintenance required on a Hornet. So obviously he would get the head on, hey, that guy needs me to make the tough. <laughs> really, you're just uh, you're the, you're just there uh, as the officer overseeing all the enlisted effort to uh, fix the aircraft and maintain. Because at any squadron, you got a bunch of pilots. You know, maybe 14 or 15 of us in a 12 aircraft squadron, uh, 16 if the, the, you know, you're lucky on the TO uh, raffle, <laughs> and then, uh, everybody else, all the maintenance, uh, is the enlisted. You know, you do have some warrant officers in the key to the critical fields, ordnance, uh, avionics and electronics because of all the electronic warfare and you know all this stuff associated with that well we did and this that's good to see who else and then you'd have communications so you'd have a couple of war officers uh, embedded in there. uh you know basically the the mustangs at the well to yeah to like staff sergeant you know gary sergeant that type of thing that they go uh, go back to uh good old quantico and uh, become a warrant officer, but then back out to the fleet. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, the knowledge uh, of being in a squadron. Uh, it's not only the flying aspect part of it, but now it's also taking care of the aircraft and learning, you know, some of the nuances of you know what what does a hornet do, what you know what t typically breaks down, what is very reliable. Uh, what to watch out for, that kind of thing.
Did you ever operate off a carrier? Only uh, for basic certification. Uh, so when you go through flight school, you will touch the both and be hit, uh, carrier qualified in intermediate. So I did that on a T2 Buckeye. Did, a, did that on the A4 Skyhawk, and then also did that on the uh, F-18. The only time you're going to go back and touch the boat is if you're getting ready to deploy with the ship, uh, with the big top. So um, when I was operations officer back at MAG-12, the Navy and Marine Corps were starting this thing called TAC Air Abrasion, where the... Uh, one of the things that was going on is, uh, and this is something that uh, it's kind of, maybe it's very nuanced or, or overlooked, or maybe people know about it and it's common knowledge, but the Navy flies around the boat and they don't really rough up their jets very much uh, because it's not unusual to take off, you brief a mission, your schedule as a Navy squadron warrant pilot. Hey, we're going to brief a 1v1 BFM training mission. You get launched off the catapult, take off, go out to a, a work in airspace or work in area, start your training, and all of a sudden they you call bingo and you're only one set into it. Instead of normally you can get three or four sets, you're one set in, bingo, because of winds across the deck. Or, you know, ship's course or something goes on for, hey, you just don't have the gas today. Uh, and we got pushed out to a farther working area because of something else going on. And then the next thing you do, you get on the ladder, what they call. So now you're just climbing up and you're stacking and you just pull. And you're just sitting there 220 to 250 knots. And then you're waiting to get the call to come on down and, and they go back to mother. So uh, what was happening in the life cycle of the F-18 is the Navy was every platform airframe has a limited number of catapults, a limited number of arrested landing or trap. Uh, a limited okay. number of uh, e-spike, that type of thing. And what was happening is the Marine Hornets had an unlimited you know, remaining uh, reserve of cats and traps because they're not touching the boat, but their poor airframes are getting, you know, bit, been around and inspected, you know, over and over. Maybe some service life extension uh, programs are put into it. Whereas the Navy was the opposite. They had high trap and high cat and low Gs. So what they started doing was swapping airframes. So they would just take a, a whole block, you know, Hey, Marine Corps, here you go. This is a new Block 15. It's like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. Here, you can have our old Waddle Levitts. And then that way the Navy could cycle them through, and we were kind of basically trying to really maximize the service life of every airframe that way. Well, part of that drug deal, if you want to call it that, was, hey, uh, if you get these new jets, because the Navy always got or stuff anyways you get these newer lot ordnance uh we're going to ask in return that you start cycling one of your squadrons onto the boat with us and that's where that's where you started seeing some of the i don't know the, the fa 18 a plus plus you know you started seeing the old a models getting these really big upgrades so that they can get into the boat cycle of and, and basically what they're trying to do is get everybody on the boat who's out flying a mission. You have the same raw gear, the same self-protect equipment, and the same weapons capabilities. You know, and, and so it, you just can't take a reserve A squadron and stick them on a boat and have them do the same missions that the guys who are flying, you know, watch 17s, you know, it's just not going to cut it. So there's, you know, different things going on. Well, Patrick, thank you for uh, coming out and talking with us. Um, my name is Ben. I'm actually trying to get into the Navy right now. Uh, just got my packet submitted for OCS candidacy for NFO. And hopefully within the next week or two, I'll hear back if I made it or not.
Uh, but one of the things that I do here in CSG3 is I'm part of the 126 Seahawks, which is our uh, the AEW of this area. We fly around in the simulated E2 and get to do a lot of AIC work on top of Cat C around the boat at ATC where we are actually on the ground simulating a, a dry landing. So my question to you is, how much did you work directly with those Hawkeyes and those other uh, ground-controlled interceptors to go and plan whatever it was you were doing for that day? Was it like you talked a couple mu- couple weeks before, days before, hours before? Like, What did that communication between the two of you look like, both on the ground and in the air? So you mean just before admission? Uh, it's up to you to... to yeah, so the sec- that. yeah, so the way to, to look at it is... Um, the Marine Corps has an organic AIC. Uh, uh, it's called the Tactical Air Operations Center, TAOC. And uh, that MOS is positive control, ground control intercept, essentially, since we don't have our own AWACS. Uh, and so what you typically would do is part of your brief is about an hour before the pilots start briefing is you get on the horn whether that's a landline out in the desert, okay, in Saudi Arabia, or it's a telephone call like I used to make from uh, Wurkoni, Japan, to Osan, Korea. Okay? Wow. And yeah, you get on the board and you talk to your, your control bird if you can. Okay, that's top of it. If you had to, they could pass it down. You'd brief somebody else who then would in turn pass it down. Uh, I prefer talking to my controller, and then that way you breathe. Hey, this is what we're going to do. You know, we're defensive power air or offensive power air, et cetera. You can whole mindset, full steam maneuver. But yeah, so you would typically you would do that uh, that you know day of, but that has to be established. So let's say you come into a theater like we used to go to get deployed to Thailand, and you know, here come the Marine Hornets, here come the Air Force F-15s, here come the Singapore L-39s, here come, you know, so we got caps and dogs all, you know, jumping right. at the, and, and we're going to do these large force exercises. And of course, here comes AWACS. Okay. But typically, what it's, when all the training is up to a certain level, everything's standardized, I don't have to go coordinate with the AWACS guys. All I need is what frequency, you know, what, here's the time on station. Uh, here's, you know, and then when it comes time for the specific mission, or this is where it gets real fun is when you do large force exercises. And I, as a section or division beat, can't just brief a controller because there's any three other aircraft out in the air. Right. And so there you will get who you get, but they're briefed in on large scale plan. And then when you get down to specifics, you could do a quick, you know, you kind of cut up the battlefield, if you will. We call them, uh, call them Fez, F E Z, all right, like Pez the candy. It's Fez. And it's fighter engagement zone. So in this lane of today, this is so and so's responsibility to, you know, here's the myth line and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and basically get everybody up to speed. But yeah, it's you, you do communicate with them directly. Uh, so, you know, and to me, the optimal thing is I'm getting on the horn. I'm leading a, a two ship or a four ship. I want to talk to the guy who I'm going to be listening to on the radio. I want to talk to him, brief what I want to do. And we clarify any, you know, uh, you know, what we call calm brevity, you know, that type of stuff. And, uh, and and then away we go. And then when I check in on station, I roll to the frequency. And, hey, you know, whatever his name was, you know, uh, Red Crown, this is uh, War Agent 3-4 on station as Frank. Under that. Gotcha. Um, and off we go. Very cool. It's kind of interesting to see just how everything together with Navy, Air Force, Marines all kind of ties together into that centralized air control and it's really interesting to be even in just the the digital dcs world to be able to talk to these individual squadrons and make everything come together into one coherent 
uh, and conjoined functioning operation is, is really interesting. Thank you for, for sharing that. Well, yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, and actually, Merlin, the uh, the red flag exercise is pretty cool for that, isn't it? Because we're all different, completely different squadrons, completely yeah. different wings. So there's a every every two or three months there is an independent VCS group community who organize a completely cross wing, cross squadron uh, or event, and they ask one squadron from each wing to you know from some wings to participate. So nobody knows anybody unless you know they're know them from youtube or you know whatever but typically it's you know uh, and our guys merlin one being one of them uh do contribute to the control aspect of it as well uh so so it's it's, it's also the sort of navy versus versus um air force uh and international you know icao departures and all of yeah. that kind of stuff gets uh gets in, intermingled and it's it's quite fascinating to to be a part of because you do have you know 40, 50 jets, um, and you know, six to eight controllers. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it gets pretty mad and it's people who never pretty much never flew together before, which is pretty cool. There's it. Thanks, bud. Yeah. You'll find that, uh, where it gets fine and in stories when we had, uh, we got sent down to, uh, Catherine, Australia, which is in the Northern territories, basically in the middle of the outback, uh, 300 miles South of, uh, Darwin. Starwin, and um, we ended up working with the Australian GCI. Okay, so you want to talk about some different communications? <laughs> uh, not only do you get the accent to work through, but then the terminology they use is a little different. And uh, right, right, right. We were debriefing a flight. So what they say over there, in Australia, single group Pepsi, you know, two one zero and fifteen thousand. What we say in the American vernacular is, you know, that they can discern it. They can say flight of two or single group or they go heavy. Where in our Australia, if it's a, a you know, uh, just a group, not a heavy group, they'll say pair, hey. flight of two. And I remember listening to the deep, we're debriefing in uh, Chad O'Connor and I were on a flight and the guy goes, you know, you know, Lance, uh, and he's in his heavy Australian accent, you know, single group, and he, and he does a great job. He's telling us exactly where the group is and what they're doing. And he goes, pear. And you can hear Ed over the other com. Pear, that's a fruit. <laughs> I want to know if that's a flight of two or a flight of four. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just It's just funny. Just little things like that that kind of catch it. And you're like, all right, we got to debrief that. Did a silly mail. Oh, three far guys. Hey. Pair is not something that's drawn on a tree or, or two, yeah. quite a two enemy guys. Kind of speaking to what Bloated said, uh, getting to do this DCS red flag with some of the other guys, not uh, as, as a group that focuses largely mostly on Navy comms and the way we do positive control where you don't have commit authority. I do compared to the air force where AWACS recommends a commit where they have commit authority in the fighters. It's a little weird to go into these situations where you've been drilled down to our basic understanding of like instinctual like what we learned to now have to say we'll recommend commit not commit this area and to do that inner working with people that maybe don't know what a commit really is going into the red flag you have a different level of experience people will commit on some people won't know how to do a carrier landing some of them won't know how to do proper flight uh flying and they're in the group because it's something new they want to try um sure. so as a controller to that aspect, having to work with different skill levels really changes the way we have to sometimes approach things, which leads to my next question. Can you tell a difference in the experience levels of some specific squadrons when it comes to the way that they interact with other squadrons around them? And this can completely be a dig at the Air Force. If you want to get in there, I would approve it. Well, okay, but this is something you got you to gotta take up. Um, I used to watch some of the F-15 squadrons do things with their intercepts that were eye-watering, okay? Um, the flaw, okay? And I'm not talking Jim Carrey <laughs> when that stupid liar, liar. Well, I'm talking, you put eight hornets line abreast, or not hornets, eight eagles line abreast at about 50,000 feet doing about Mach 1.5, 
Okay. And they're conning, right? They're marking. Okay. Contrails galore. And so each one is a mile apart. And then each division is probably two miles to three miles apart. So you're talking, you know, almost 12 miles. It's a lot of airspace. Yeah. And then the call comes in. When they commit, they go claw. And they just they just push the stick forward. And after burners lit, and they come down. Okay. And it's pretty impressive looking. And it looks like two, you know, flaws coming out of the heavens. And it's like, that's not something you want to see. But when they come in to pre-merge and post-merge, you clean up the intercept. Very well disciplined. I mean, that's, but if you think about it, that's what their job is. Okay. The, the Air Force's, you know, job is to have air dominance, if you will. Right. If you're an eagle, you're not going to be swinging bombs around unless you're a mud hat. They have that 15 eagle. Okay. Uh, if you're a viper, you could do both. All right. But if you're an A 10, you're not going to be doing, you know, GCI controlled intercepts. All right. So you could start to see where the skill sets really start to refine themselves in those specific areas. Uh, and then the cool thing about the Hornet is you have to be the jack of all trade, good at close air support, uh, you know, good at the, you know, Beat interdictions, good at you know uh, BFM, good at intercepts and trip or try to be. So what you tended to notice, at least in the Marine Corps, was some units tended to kind of go 60-40 on their air to ground training versus air to air training, and others would go the other way. So you kind of knew amongst yourselves, you know, hey, so and so is in that squadron. I'm talking intermarine gear. Okay, hey, the Red Devils. Those guys are good at air to air, you know, the snakes, they're good at air to ground, you know, that type of thing. And when you say they're good at, it means they're, that's the, they're, uh, they establish their notoriety as, Hey, we want to have a good solid game plan as close air support. Like, okay, that's great. And that's all, you know, prerogative of commanding officer and training officer and heavy. Now, inter-service, when we talk that we compare ourselves to other guys, the only guys we used to, uh, to try to, you know, rub, you know, rough up and beat our chest again for the Viper guys, the F-16, because they could do both air to air and air to ground, just like we did. So now we currently had, okay, we started at the same level playing field as what we look at. So we could start comparing, you know, apples and oranges that way that, you know, uh, intersects. Uh, Navy it didn't really, uh, the only time you really start mixing a lot up with the Navy is when you got into joint exercises uh, up in the uh, Fallon, Nevada area. Um, well, out back then, outside of uh, Top Gun. Um, uh, and then Top Gun ended up moving uh, up into the China Lake area, I believe. But yeah, the, uh, or I'm sorry, I, I misspoke there. Back when the Navy was uh, doing Top Gun at a Miramar, there was a lot of uh, uh, inter, uh, basically interagency, interservice training because of the close proximity of uh, the way. But yeah, it, overall, it's very professional, very well done. I remember uh, one time I got sent out to be, uh, we were on a detachment here. We're, I'm out here in Tucson. Like, to any, the current A10 guys. So we're up supporting doing some air to ground training for the Marines, but then we're also providing red air support for the eight tents and they want to do these visual engagements and, you know, practice their, uh, mutual support and section maneuvering and that kind of thing. Uh, to what level that's something that I haven't watched enough DCS to get an appreciation of is how well are, is the mutual support, you know, you know, covering your guys six, you know, and, and you know, wingmen, you, you you never go anywhere without a wingman type of thing. Um, I haven't been able to pick up on that because I just, I have to get more exposure to it to see, because, you know, some of the inner cockpit stuff, but one of the things you'll start to realize as a pilot is, yeah, what you see in front of you, like a HUD and all this stuff, and you got, you know, you're managing your own cockpit with your weapons and everything. I'm worried about my wingman over here, who's about 1.3 miles away, and I'm keeping sight of him making sure he's in position 
making sure nobody's trying to jump him and, you know, listening to his status of his raw status and, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, there, there's very, you know, there's a lot going on there, but what you typically started comparing wasn't stick and rudder skills. Okay. Or who had the, the tightest CEP on a bombing range. Right. You know, you know, I, I missed the target by eight feet, you know, and I was 11 feet. And it just comes, you know, cooler. Ah, I missed by 300, but he's a good stick and rudder guy, but he slung that one away. But what you started um, appreciating was other squadrons ability to employ as a section, as a division, and how well they were mutually supported one another. As soon as you stuff your nose into a fight and you're with, you took the guy out, then the next thing you know, there's a guy right on him. It's like, ah, well, okay, now I got to work on him. So, yeah, they're, they're watching out for each other. And that's what you started to gain in the fleet swoops. Very cool. Thank you. That actually ties very similar into the statement to that, is that when we look at the comparisons, at least from the people I've talked to that are in the Navy right now, doing command and control, uh, the actual one for us is uh, Saber Stevens. He's the commander of the 126E Ops for us. He's actually a JG in the military out in Virginia. And okay. he, te he teaches us a little bit about some of the way that communications work and how it sounds different when you have an E3 controlling things compared to an E2, where very much like you said in the Air Force, you'll have your individual sets of pilots that will do their single thing really, really well. But when it comes to cohesiveness, the United States Navy and the Marines working with the Navy have a lot closer inner working because we don't have the luxury of just dipping off and leaving if something goes wrong because we're, we're all on the same boat. So right. I think I think you answered that that pretty well to what I was kind of expecting. Um, so thanks for that. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and one of the other, and just so, whilst you brought up the word commit, commit authority, we used to get into these philosophical, tactical discussions, if you will. And, and basically, it would always come down, you know, some of us curmudgeon old guys after a while would just say, dog died. They either meet the commit criteria or they don't. It doesn't matter who says the word commit. If you brief us, they come within 80 miles of this airfield, we're going after them, you know, or, you know, whatever, whatever scenario it is. So they either meet it or they don't. Okay. And, you know, they, people get into the newest, it's like, Look, keep it simple for us knuckle draggers, okay? We got enough to worry about up in the air. So they either meet it or they don't. And if they meet it, we're leaving. I don't care who you are. I'm going to commit. Then, now the fire control, like if you say, you know, clear to arm and fire, you know, hostile bandit and all that type of stuff. Okay, yeah, now I can see where I got to rate, you know, reach my left hand up and, and move the master on to arm to deploy weapons. Okay, that falls under the rules of the gate. But committing on somebody is just, hey, just chase them away. You know, they come hot. They're 80 miles within the airfield. You're, you know, hot target. Go at them, point their nose at them, spike them, and then they turn around and leave. It's like, okay, well, you know, hey, GCI, AIC, monitor, please. We're going to turn our tails to them and we set the cap. And if we have to recommit them, you know, if they beat the Smith crate. So, yeah, we used to... Mr. Roller eyes at some of the fun discussions, like guys, just keep it simple. It makes it so much makes life so much easier. Did, uh, did you find mostly dual seat or single seat audits? I, I have more time in the single seat than the dual, but uh, all my combat, my red ink time was uh, over in Iraq. That was all two seat uh, because by then I was at the wing staff. So I was flying at best more than anything else. And so what, whatever squadron would roll into Al-Assad, I would just go down to flight equipment, grab my gear, go drop it off with them, check me out, everything's good, and then say, hey, please put me on the schedule. And you know, I'd go, of course, I'm here as the commanding officers by then. You know, and I'd go talk to whoever and say, hey, you know, good to see you, welcome. You know, if there's anything you need here at the airfield, I'll take care of it. And if you could put me on the schedule, they were good about it. about once a week. I used to get out of the office and go, uh, go free flight some live uh, ham rams, Mavericks, JDAM, uh, and sidewinders and you know, lightning pods and go raging around the desert looking for 
flipping for travel. <laughs> and the only time we uh, I got to employ was uh, 5th Marine Regiment made contact with a pretty significant uh, group. And we were, you were, you were uh, doing some reconnaissance with the lightning pod for one of the other front uh, Ford air controllers. And all of a sudden we got a call from the uh, direct air support center. They said 5th Marine contact down uh, near Ramadi. It's actually Lake Ramadi at um, so we had to say adios, they'll touch the tanker on the way there. And then, uh, I got to, uh, some unfortunate individual tried to escape and decided to swim through Lake Ramadi <laughs> in and amongst the, uh, the Wadi. And if you're familiar with the Wadis out there, you have these giant reeds that are, you know, 12, 15 feet tall. It's like a a mini jungle yeah, and amongst the water, you know, especially near the water, the lower, uh, the shallow water, make the, the four army guys, the Apaches were out there trying to hunt them down, shooting flechettes at this guy and they can't get them. They can't see him. Tell. Cause there's, you know, there's such a, and we're up top watching them. We're like, he's right there. We're trying to laze for him. But you know, the diffusion of the laser in, in, in a wadi is just crazy. And, and, uh, so we, uh, we got close, but basically an element of their fighting force, the enemy fighting force fled into the water. And that wasn't the thing to do because they basically got hunted down, you know, you know, the old fish in a barrel type of thing. And the last remaining guy, the Apaches had the bingo. So they cleared the airspace below us and we went in, but the, the, um, I didn't have to use a Maverick or a Jade app or anything that. I wasn't going to waste all that money. And it's like, here, this, we take care of it with some, with some <laughs> white meter mission accomplished. So <laughs> nice. But, damn. Uh, talk a little bit about kind of the differences of flying the single seat and the dual seat and kind of what was your preference and kind of what was easier in dual seat with somebody else helping you. Uh, yeah, the, the single seat, okay, so let's talk uh, flight performance before we talk crew coordination. Flight performance, so you got this big uh, canopy tub, as we called it, uh, on the two-seater. So it's much longer. That creates a different pressure wave over the uh, fuselage, okay, uh, in and around the upper fuselage area. So if you think about it, all that air is going back in between the tails. Now, I... Um, you could at high units, uh, high angle of attack. All right. Which the Hornet thrives in. Okay. Very maneuverable. If you weren't careful, you could yaw that plane and it behaved differently than a single seater. And you could depart that, that two seater a little bit easier than the single seater and didn't want it that, uh, I remember, uh, one of the old skippers of a 2C squatter got in trouble for partying in. And the reason was, he, even though he was a skipper, he was a backseater, you know, which so they had done. He could feel the side forces increasing, and instead of telling his, you know, young hard charger up in the front cockpit, hey, you know, cool it. He didn't, didn't say anything, and whap, they snapped into a departure. He got to meet the general. <laughs> for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the single seater, basically the two performed almost identical. Um, your center of gravity was slightly different only because, you know, they tried to balance all that out, but it works out, you know, pretty much the same. So you're 700 pounds lighter of fuel, which as a single seat guy, you don't like, you should always want more fuel, always want more air speed, always want the trout. On. And, but, uh, slow speed flying is pretty much the same, uh, landing and takeoff, same, you know, pretty much identical. He's really not going to notice any difference there. Um, where you really start to notice it is, uh, basically it's just the, 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 with that little single, single piece canopy. On a single seater, you're just a little bit more streamlined, so you can get a little more pump out of that plane. So, 
yeah, the only time, uh, twice in my career, I went up, touched 50,000 feet and, you know, going faster than 1.0. I don't think I could have done that in the tub. Was, unless it was clean, I might have been able to. It had the uh, EPE engines and cleaned the grease. I, well, the single sear is two axe. And uh, now the crew coordination part, essentially the Wizzo now, uh, you're not, you're not, ta you're basically uh, sharing tasks, but you assign a priority. Wizzo controls the sensors, okay, the radar, the FLIR, lightning FOD, whatever that may be. Uh, he's in charge of putting out the expendables for self-protection. Whether that's you know flares or chat, et cetera, so he's doing it, doing that, and he can do all the talking. Up until a point where you need to come in, like I had to butt in on that one mission I was talking about, where we trapped, cornered that guy in Ramadi. I mean, the Wizzo was trying to talk the Apaches onto the target in water, which is fun trying to grab a ge you know <laughs> a geographical reference point. And I said, I, I was watching and watching and I was keeping my mouth shut, being a single seat guy and I'm going to be disciplined and good. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, Hey, you know, Hey spuds, let me, let me take this for just a second. And there's, yes, sir, go ahead. And I got on the radio and I go, Hey, you know, war agent, whatever Apache call something. Fly this heading. And he started flying that heading. I go, your shadow is going to pass over him, right? Three, two, one, now. And they're like, Oh, there he is. You know, and. So I did something a little unorthodox, but I'm like, why you're okay, see so where your shadow is? Just drag it right over the target now. And then, then they knew what part of who, you know, wanted to look in. So but other than that, I think that was the only time I ever jumped in and set up people. But yeah, as a single seat guy, you gotta do you gotta juggle all the balls at once. So, you know, when you when you're when you're developed in that community or in that environment, and then you go into a two-seat environment, you have to, you know, calm down and, and learn how to task share, uh, not, not live, they were critical about that. You don't shed your tasks. Like I don't drop communication. I had to listen to everything that he was saying and everything that's coming in the plane. It was just as if I was speaking. So in case something, you know, if he gets overcome by events, like and says, I got to go heads down and, and fix this flare because it's acting up, that I can take the comms, take the radar, and, and no problem, okay? So yeah, it, uh, it is, it's a little different, but it, it's rad. You just have to learn how to food port, and, and it takes a little training, at least a little practice. Yeah, we, we only have the single seat in, in DCS currently for the Hornet, so we've all... One of the things we all say, man, that there's some times that a, a D would be nice to have for, you know, training type stuff or, and you're, you know, trying to do fat K. Like a lot of times you're trying to do that by yourself and it can get a little overwhelming. Do they have, um, do they have a flying all officers meeting that we used to call the EA 6B Prowler and <laughs> put, put four officers in one aircraft? <laughs> the uh, intercom communication <laughs> during brief. But yeah, you had all these different missions. So I was, it, it would be interesting if they would be able to crew up a single aircraft and then now have four of you out on a mission just flying two aircraft. You know what I mean? Uh, so maybe you would, you would quickly learn where discipline communication comes into effect. Yeah. You know, the, um, I don't know if you all learned the calm brevity word, Judy. And that's probably the brevity I hate the most because it means I have failed at my job. Well, it can actually, it, it doesn't necessarily mean fail. It just means gut up. <laughs> don't want to hear any. Yep. There's something else going on. That's a little bit more important to this guy being, we actually, oh had, yeah. We actually had a guy that was squadron called Judy. That was his call sign. I could not. <laughs> he would see what he was at. Yeah, so we called him Judy. <laughs> we, we had a guy like that. We called him Wolf. <laughs> we, we called him? Just an end joke. Uh, we called him Wolf. That was his call sign. 
the uh, the closest we have to that double crew is actually the BF one of three Jolly Rogers in the squadron, and they fly the Tomcat. So yeah, the they've B. got the pilot and the Rio. So oh, okay, that's we've definitely seen a lot of of funny conversations happen between the pilots and the Rios because when you fly DCS just as a pilot at the Tomcat, you have a gesture AI in the back, very generic commands that he kind of will listen to sometimes. And it's a nightmare to fight with. But you can actually, we have trained inside of 103. There's entire uh, training regiments for pilots. And then there's a, a separate one just for Rios. So how to do those communications, make all of those things happen, proper employments of the Phoenixes, Sparrows, how to make sure the pilot knows who wants. And when I've had the chance to be a Rio every once in a while for those guys, you'll notice on some of the earlier ones that you could really hit on this of not shedding your responsibilities. They'll want a human Rio so they can see, oh, all I have to do is think about is flying now. I don't have to think. It's like, no, no, you don't. You actually have to think more now. Because you've got somebody else who's going to question you. Right, so you got to monitor that, especially when you're doing an interstate. That's getting, you know, I'm watching that radar. And, you know, he does the rainfall search in the, you know, single target track, track ball scan. He reports yeah. it out, you know, sets the proper target. And then when it's time to employ weapons, he says, your radar. Roger, you know, I know right back, but then I take it and then employ and then either snip it or, you know, cut it as needed or, you know, they'll, you know, left hole, whatever it may be at that way we go, whatever the tactic is. Well, they're going to clean the merge up or we're going to bug. And at that point, it's back to, you know, do a radar. Don't pan it back to him. It's all the way he goes. This freaking, and we've got that as well. We'll call your radar, my radar, my radar, your radar. Yeah. And it's it's definitely a completely different experience, even just from the full side going into the backseat of the Tomcat, just how different it is to have, and you've got that communication where you may be doing back A with a lantern pod and using the Tomcat's radar to be that AWACS within the game and making those call outs. Like, I definitely see how being in a twin seat of Hornet can be a very similar situation. Did you ever have the chance to do FAC A or work with anybody on FAC A while you were flying in the two seater? Uh, yes. Yeah, we had some. One of the things, one of the disciplines that they lost, they dropped, I don't know why the Marine Corps it just kind of silently went away, it was called Tac Eddy. He used to have a tactical air coordinator here who could do both FAC A and uh, imagine he could also help manage the stacks of multiple aircraft waiting to come in and, and then link up with the core air controller. Or if he needed to, he could be the Ford Air Controller Air Boards, you know, mark a target for him and say, there it is, go get it. And I'm on target, et cetera. And one just I went free left. But um, yeah, we got to work with the uh, back A's. And, but for the most part, one of the things that the, the Iraqi theater was much different. It was because now everything, you've got all that, that you know, with that. Battle link, everything's linked if title C and everything else. And so now you're getting the picture. So the only thing AMC is going to provide for me is anything that's outside of what battle are not party, you know, that again. Now, to be honest with you, the data link picture could be gigantic. Okay. But as a Hornet guy, I don't need to see beyond 80 miles, you know, picture. This first of all, I can tear less. You know, if they're a hundred and you know eighty-eight miles away from me, they're not a threat. Okay, even if I with them and blazing away, uh, they're not a threat till they. Okay, now they're getting the you know eighty to sixty nautical miles, and it's like okay, now I need to pay attention to that. It's like the picture's there. You know, depending on how many assets you have, I'm grounded and there at at give it time. Uh, but yeah, it just. Typically, what it is is, hey, this is my little thiefdom. I'm going to worry about this little, you know, cast mission. And uh, I know I got, you know, Big Brother watching over my shoulder. and will you know if there's a threat. Yeah. Typically, now this is another thing, too. You do not be cast in a restrictive environment. If there's surface-to-air threats, uh, if there's significant air-to-air -air threats, you're not doing cast. And the ground component commander knows that. Okay, and so you have to do what's going on now is interdiction. You got your CF missions going. 
trying to suppress that knock sense and, you know, either push it back or get rid of it, then you can lose gas because gas is so, uh, you're so focused at the battlefield. I'm looking at the ground. I'm, you know, even though it's 40 miles over there, I'm looking for dust, smoke, you know, flashes of explosion, everything. That's where the action is. I can't, and if I get spiked by an SA-6 and I know that it's, you know, way three miles away, it's like, what am I doing? I got to get out of here. I got to move, you know, and I get, so yeah, you, so the whole picture is built before you get thrown into an environment too, right? I, I don't know to what level TCS, uh, and to, to, you know, maybe throws that in the mix, like, hey, here's the, today's scheme of maneuver. Check the alpha, you know, up on this mountain and what's going on. And then everybody forms and everybody just shows up and it says, go out and fly it. If you meet some MIGs, go get them. You know, it really but- comes down to the way the mission is designed by the mission creator. And generally that'll be brief before. And there will actually be a full proper brief and a comms ladder and an operation flow and state of the state of the enemy and what they're bringing, as well as the oasis you have within that certain coverage and what threats to expect. I mean, that's all created in the missions. Um, so we, the mission creator will know that beforehand, but everyone else that comes with it may or may not get briefed on every take just so they have to do a little bit of pre-planning, but also, um, come in expecting something. I think, uh, either bones or bloke can, or, uh, cyborg can speak more to that as they do that more on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you know, the folks with, you know, prior military experience, especially, you know, aviation military experience, they come in and, you know, we can brief a scenario and. 10 minutes now to layman or, you know, the enthusiast who's just getting involved with DCS and flying up, get up line of departure. You know, what is that? You know, <laughs> and that those kind of, you can get a, you got to, they have to understand the basic scheme maneuver and that kind of thing. And maybe that's something that I guess the ambition developer would have to tailor it to his audience. To, yeah, you because know, if I got on DCS with a bunch of old, you know, Hornet guys, you know, we'd be slaying around with slang words. We know what, you know, we're going to do. But, hey, guys, let's be serious. Okay. And we go up with a real scenario and you know, all about necessarily they'll fail into, you know, this kid, with, you know, get someone who's just, hey, I, I do BCS, but, you know, I'm fresh out of college. And I've never been in the military. And it's like, all right, hold on tight. This is going to be fun. You know, and the way we go. One, and, and I think that's one of the things that is is a hard balance for us because, you know, I'm sure for you guys that, you know, if you had a two-hour flight, you were probably spending double that in a brief and, you know, maybe double that in a debrief. Whereas for us, you know, we've got, you know, this is a hobby and, you know, we've got maybe three hours to go. So we've got to say, okay, we want two hours in the jet. We've got maybe 30 minutes before, maybe 15 minutes afterwards. So trying to figure out, you know, what's important and what to do because, you know, the last thing people want to do is, you know, sit around planning for two hours before we go up. So right, that's hard for us because there's a lot more that would, it would go better if we had the time to, to really spend and, and brief it all out. But at the same time, it's, you know, I think we'd run everybody off if we did that. Well, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, and again, this is something that the impression in my mind, it harkens back to uh, Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> you know, okay, I want you to go in and go get to drag it and get this, and all of a sudden the guy just takes off. That's when he did the third, you no, know, and the the guy Wolf Blow was talking about earlier, we he almost got his call sign changed to Leroy. <laughs> well, sometimes you earn those things. So, so until recently, um, the, the the whole mission design kind of thing was a very sort of predetermined affair. You had to really spend a lot of time, and I mean hours and hours and hours a single one of us would spend you know designing the mission producing all of the you know powerpoints or whatever what have you um recently the uh there's a third party developer who made a tool for us where we can change the battlefield up while people are flying because previously you have to design the mission save it and then you host it and that's it you know and if you just have to absolutely change something and that's it. Everybody's out. Everybody's spooling their jets up again in five minutes, you know. So now we actually get a tool which allows us to uh, to do smaller scenarios, but very very quickly. So um, we had a we, we had a, a mission that that we were running 
uh, I think tags you made it for for our sort of more experienced guys. And then at the same time, in the same mission, I took the newbies out and I said to them, look, you're just going to be, you know, providing DCA for the carrier group whilst these other guys are doing the mission that's pre-done. Well, I'm just going to be throwing in a couple of MiG-21s or, you know, or whatever, what have you dynamically into the mission and just creating those little tiny scenarios, which are much, much easier to, for them to, you know, uh, to jump in and, and, and react to without affecting the entire mission where everybody else is flying. So they could get the exposure to, you know, to the comms around the boat and, and, and maybe the, uh, you know, command and control, uh, frequency for the other guys while they're operating. And then, you know, I can still throw little bits and pieces at them without having to restart the whole mission. So it, it has been improving significantly in the last year or so. Yeah, thank well, it's good to hear. It's, uh, sounds like it is getting pretty, uh, pretty involved and trying to get it as close to their mobile as they can. That, uh, that's pretty interesting. I had one question because earlier you were talking about, you know, cooperating with, with Apaches, which, which by the way, we also do, we, we don't fly them as a group as much, but we do have uh two seater, uh, Apaches. We have, uh, the Mudhen recently as well, which is also obviously a two seater and we do have, um, um, some other aircraft that are two seaters. There's an F four coming. That's going to be a two seater, I believe. And, uh, we've, I think we've got the, uh, hind as well, which is a two seat helicopter, obviously. So. Um, my question was going to be, um, did you operate with, um, another, um, relight disabled jet, uh, that we all know and love, which is the Harrier. Uh, did you, did you work with any of those guys, uh, during your missions? But, um, typically you, uh, what you need to work with them is, well, obviously you're going to provide, you know, you know, bad guy support, you know, they want Bobby air and you get both air. We come in and simulate a big 29 worms. And when you get embedded with them, you don't necessarily see, I don't know, you know, peace, love, and harmony of Hornets and Harriers. <laughs> your Harriers are your strikers and the Hornets now are going to fly high cover or get a fap. Uh, they could also be strikers, but uh, you know, the Harrier packages, typically those guys, you would work it where we would, if let's say I have a large scale exercise going on, I'm going to, I got my AWACS, you know, if I got AWACS or my GPCI is going to paint as big, you know, better, best of pictures they can up to, you know, whatever they can see. I got my tankers, you know, I got my Armada, the C-130s, we can touch and get gas as we need coming on and off cap if we're defensive or if we're offensive we have strikers, we're going to protect those Harrier guys because they're probably going to come in a little bit lower and, you know, because they're, uh, they're much more accurate, uh, a little bit higher bomber. So we need to provide them the best coverage. So we sweep out with the prowlers and do all the jamming and any sea ad that needs to be done to basically clear a path. These guys get, you know, they strike in. We'll, we can also provide escort for them, but you don't necessarily see Hornets and Harriers embedded, you know, within visual range of one another. Yeah. Like, you know, like a wingman type of thing, you know, will be, you know, mutually supported, you know, through, you know, the uh, radar, you know, on the intercept path after you know, the, you know, the strike back into death. Um, for, yeah, you do work with them, but that's how the coordination is done. I'm pretty much up to that. Point. Ben wants the Harriers got the, the skinny on what, this is how the mission's going to happen. So he, Put their head down and they just say, Hey, here's how we're going to peel this onion. This is how the target's going to be, you know, going to employ weapons, these type of weapons and type of deliveries. Yeah, here's our ingress and egress, you know, routes. You know, here's our four criteria, just, you know, 83 big 29s, pure over the horizon, we're out, you know, missions of scrub that, you know, so they go through all those wickets, you know. Like, yeah, do you, do you, when you, Working together, that's working together for us is, you know, we'll, we'll fly our cover. You fly your strike baggage and one for work to save us. Absolutely. And, and this is, uh, what it works out for us as well. Cause we, we do have a, um, AV8B, um, squadron within the wing here as well. 
So when we do have those joint missions, that's pretty much how the cookie crumbles. You know, they they do the they do the mud and we do the top, that's it. pretty much. But it's really great to kind of understand that you know that dynamic. You know, we, then you kind of have the responsibility for them to be to be safe. We we're going to be doing the suppression and uh, or the sea ad for them, and then they can come in. Uh, you know, sure. Yeah, because yeah, the the strikers want to hear is hey, if there's a threat, you know, particularly airborne threat, uh, then they'll breathe in there that hey, this strike route is going to lean away. Okay. And what they want to hear is the Hornets committing or, you know, the fighters committing to basically stiff arm them out of range. So now they come in unimpeded in target area. All people put it all about. Come in, they're claiming release or weapon and get out of there. Yeah. You know, we just stiff arm, you know, boy is needed, but then we have to just chase the bad guys away. And then you put it has some, yeah, they, you got to work together in the lakes. It's just like think of a, a sports analogy with the lineman and the running back. Um, running back's got the ball, but the lineman's got to clear a path. You know, just a little opening if all he needs. Okay, that, that's his mission. Well, Creighton, did we talk your ear off enough? <laughs> um, I do have one more question. Um, cause you mentioned it to me the other day and now, now I want to hear the story of how you became a part of the Martin Baker club. Oh yes. Caterpillar club. <laughs> um, I am a lifetime member uh, as of May 9th, 2000. Uh, so I'll be coming up on my 24th anniversary here next month. I had the shell out of a hornet. Uh, I was flying with uh, a Navy pilot going through the F-18 school. So I was an instructor at the time out at the Miramar. We were in a two-seater, and the mission was his first time dropping ordnance with an F-18. Bang. And that's always fun when you take a new <laughs> guy and he starts slinging iron down to the ground. Uh, he, they're all over the place, but you know, he's still, he's, he was a good, good stick. Uh, his call sign was Benny. Uh, his last name was Hill. <laughs> Me, little Benny Doe. But Benny he was a Navy, uh, I think he was a JG time. I was a 04, so I was a major. Uh, I was the training officer. I am a we brief. Uh, four ship, uh, what we call circle the wagons. Um, get, you know, basically concentric rings painted on the ground, you know, big target in a Hulk and in the bullseye with other miscellaneous target out at the shade tree, uh, target complex, which is just north of interstate eight, uh, right next to El Centro, just north of El Centro, California, halfway between San Diego and Yuma. Uh, if you're looking at Southern California, almost smack dab. And so we're down there. Uh, we're doing a left hand 15,000 foot, 45 degree dive, 7,000 foot release, you know, 7,500 foot release, if I remember correctly, back up. And, and we have a four ship and everybody, and we call it circle the wagons, you know. So essentially what happens is as you drop your weapon, okay, you're releasing and you're on the dive, you can hear the plane behind you fall in. So that means him bringing his nose to bear towards the target. And then as you pull up off the target after you release, you see your interval in front of you who's coming, who is just coming off target. So it's pretty tight. Okay, you can keep sight of everybody. We're with all within a couple you know, miles and we are on our 11 so we had 12 practice bonds take the fairing single center line for it fill MERS under the wings six bombs a piece so we breathe one bomb at a time and we taught them different uh different hud techniques ccip auto uh manual you know you, to go through the steps uh, and you basically work your way up. 
and uh, he's on his 11th pass of 12. So we're almost done. Okay. Comes down, drops a pretty decent get, you know, pretty good release. I could tell by the uh, parameters of the aircraft and everything, you know, because I'm watching for HUD. Uh, I could see his HUD back there, but I could also, I could tell what angle of bank the wings were, how many G's were on the aircraft. And, you know, he's, you don't want to see negative G and all this nonsense. You think it's to do. Goofy things happen the coordinates. So he releases, we pull off, we kept sight of our interval that's in front of us. We're because we're dash three in the flight of four. Right. So there's dash two. And it's about to have it did he base the files that they air. All of a sudden it felt like we collided with another aircraft, which made no sense because I heard dash four call in. <laughs> as we're pulling off Mark. So I know everybody's separated. Because I can see two, I heard four, and bam. Well, Benny's flying, I'm the instructor, okay? So I'm not doing anything other than trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Uh, no kidding, it was about a second and a half after that big thud that the engine fire left uh, comes, okay? Uh, so Benny, the, basically the bald face procedures is, you know, throttled off. Okay. He shut the ending down. He got acquired. And so I'm thinking no big deal. Okay. That throttle comes off. Cool. We got another engine. We'll do a single edge. I look over my right shoulder and I go, there's El Centro right there. 8,000 foot runway. That's the Blue Angels practice all the time. Hey, we're going to save the day. Okay, a uh, little stressful. Uh, maybe five seconds after he shut that left motor off, we had engine fire right. Okay. And I look down and I see the right throttle start to come back. Okay. And I think what Benny was thinking was min practical for flight. Well, unfortunately, when you come off a farming run, we were pointing. 45, you know, 30 degrees nose up, then decelerating rapidly, especially since we just lost one motor. And, you know, they can't come back on the throttle when your nose is high like that. So I grabbed the stick and I jammed it, lighted the afterburner. And I said, ah, no, 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 don't do that. You know, they said, we need power and let's get the nose down. So they're flying this aircraft because now we got dual firelights and he hadn't. So the procedure is, you know, throttle off, you know, firelight push. So when you push a firelight, it arms the fire extinguisher system. Hmm. Then you hit the fire extinguisher system. So it's two separate buttons there. He didn't even have a chance to push the firelight by the time we're venting firelight. Heck, so now we have, you know, sequential engine fires rapidly one after the other, which is not in the NATOPS win. But <laughs> So now we're dealing with the dual engine fire. Well, so we're losing airspeed, okay, and we're losing thrust. And so I tell Benny, I said, I got the jet. And he says, you got it. And he throws his hands up, and then he immediately puts his hands back down. And what he's doing is he's tightening his lap. <laughs> he's cinching in the, in the seat real tight. And... uh as I got the the right, you know, motor full, you know, full afterburner, not knowing that the right, you know, the left motor was done because we shut it off. The right motor was eating itself. And unfortunately, we didn't have enough altitude and airspeed to do a read like, uh, you know, we, you know, hindsight being 2020, what had happened is the, the fire detection system in the Hornet uh, goes on for two different reasons. The ambient temperature inside the engine bay reaches a certain temperature, okay? Or fire line, you know, which are those fine little wires that has multiple, but it's like a simple spider web coming back. In case you get shrapnel or some chunk part of the motor comes out, that cuts the, one of those lines, that'll give you a fire line indication. What had happened was the right motor was coming apart. And it sent a fragment into the left engine bay, cutting the left fire detection system, giving us a left firelight first. 
Okay. Had it just been a right engine fire, put the fire out. So what was happening is we didn't see this, but as we're climbing up, dash four comes off target and sees us now apexing over our over the hill, and he just sees a ball of flame, ninety feet long, coming out of the time. Okay. So the it, you know the mishap board went through a full investigation, and essentially the culprit was the right board. Okay. But unfortunately, it damaged the lap fire detection system, which forced us to shut, you know, by, by procedure, you know, shut the edge down. Well, if you can get 250 knots and if you're, you know, below 10,000 feet, okay, you can restart a motor that you set down t- to spool up the RPMs on the N1 fan, you know, the front fan. Unfortunately, left engine's off, right loader has just now ate itself. And as we apex and the nose is coming over, I got the throttle pull thinking I'm in afterburner, but I'm watching and the RPM is coming down and I'm pulling back on the stick and I'm not getting any response. Okay. And the Hornet has three different flight control with, you know, CAS, okay, computer augmented. Uh, then you have DDL, direct electric link. And then you have mechanical, which is simply... I got cables running back to the stabilators, okay? And I can fly the Hornet that way. Well, I'm pulling on the stick and nothing's happening. That nose is just tracking straight down to ground, okay? About the time the nose gets about 10 degrees below the horizon, generators kick off mine, which means that tells me we're now below 60% on the motor that was on. Now, just it's probably just a chunk of burning metal right now then it's worthless so we lost our generators and unfortunately in the hornet you cannot that you cannot glide in a hornet because once you've lost your generators and lost hydraulic power and even your in mechanical like your 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 zot that now we've just been boxed into a corner that you can't get out today i i just over the intercom uh, said to Benny, I said, are you ready? <laughs> and, yes, sir. And I said, all right, eject, eject, eject. And bam, we went out. So we were probably at about 8,000 feet pointed straight down toward the earth. So you go through the trauma of all that. So in the Hornet, the sequence goes back seater first and front seater. Okay. And the reason is, is you don't want the front seater to go first because then his rocket blast would come over the guy in the back, you know, with the airstream and all that. So I go out. So canopy basically just gets clamshelled open a little bit into the airstream and get ripped away. And then my seat goes and then Granny's gear goes. But because we're pointed nose down, by the time the chute opens up and I feel the shock of that and I looked up and I grab the rises and I see a good shoot. I look down and there's Benny about 300 <laughs> feet below me in his shoot. But I see his arms are up holding on to his risers. I said, okay, that tells me Benny's conscious, which is good. And then right between my keels, for Benny's like right here as I'm looking down, and then directly below is a punch group. <laughs> I felt it's a hornet that just lawn darted right into the desert out there at the shade tree. You know, bucking. So, so yeah, that whole uh, that whole sequence that I just described from the found that you know one of the cubs on the shift of the seventy seconds to bank. That's how long it took to go through that. So yeah, that was my uh, my shelling my shell hour experience. It's incredible. Good. Um, it, did it answer your question? <laughs> it did. It did. Uh, did, did, the, uh, did the investigation ever work out why the right motor disintegrated? Uh, this happened. This has happened. I, I only know it. Uh, 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 it barber was taking off out of Kumsan one time. And now I'll. Oh, well, late T stories. He was taken off and he's on his takeoff roll. So typically what you do is you run up to mill power, wipe out the controls, you get your feet on the brakes, everything looks good, temperatures, RPMs, and then you release the brakes and then go into full afterburn. 
He goes into full afterburner as the plane lunches forward. He's probably at 30, 40 knots, not very fast. I mean, he can't even see it at the HUD because the HUD only goes down to 48 knots. And kaboom, same thing. Big explosion. Engine fire. You know, I, I forget which side it was, but he gets the engine fire. Okay, aborts the takeoff, shuts off the motor, pulls off the runway, shuts the plane down, gets out, and, you know, crash fire and rescue come over and, you know, put out the smoke. What had happened was, so imagine the fuselage, that long pencil, like, fuselage of the Hornet. You got those little intakes kind of receding way back there underneath the Lexus. And that intake wall, okay, is right by the fuel cells, the internal fuel cells, which are behind the cockpit. Okay, tanks one through four. And... What had happened is the intake wall actually failed, okay, because there's a lot of suction and pressure, you know, delta P coming through that when those engines are pulling. And it was just a fatigue tractor, and literally the intake wall just cracked open a little bit, and then you have all that, you know, force coming in, and it just dumped. It just ripped the, the bladder of the fuel thing right into the intake, and that was just adjusted right into the motor, which just, you know, Injecting raw fuel at the front end uh, creates for quite a you know amazing effect you know with an engine like that. So boom. So it, they actually had to straighten the airframe as because the damage that was done to that. Yeah, was you know the subsequent uh, concussion of the explosion and everything. That is what they think happened to us, airborne. Coming off target, you go to full power. Coming up, not going after butter, but you're at full power. And if that intake wall fails, it's going to ingest itself. Okay, it's going to ingest the intake. It's gonna, and here's why they think that the investigative mishap board. So they can go through when when you lawn dart an aircraft into the ground like that. Your great big you know turbo fan engine or turbojet is now crushed down to about a foot and a half, two foot tall, right? Just accordion. Layer by layer, they go through and they figure out what's going on. And the reason they do that is they can tell if the engine was still turning when it impacted the ground because they'll find dirt and natural you know, debris a couple of stages in. Or if it's only at stage one, they know the engine wasn't turning, et cetera. So they can figure all this out. Here's what they did find. Back through uh, the different layers of the motor, they found a material that was non-organic and it was identical to the same material that they used to put the embedded fibers in those self-sealing fuel cells that are inside the rubber. So now they're thinking, okay, they can't 100% say that's exactly what happened, but how did those fibers get into the front of the engine and then make its way to the back of the motor? That should those fibers should not have been there. So they think that that's a there's a good possibility that we swallowed our own intake, which is bizarre. No one, and then subsequent you know fire. But then when that right motor went, you know, clam, unfortunately, it that that firewall between the two engines on an F eighteen. If you had both engines removed and you walked into a hangar and you were standing up in the empty hangar uh, or the empty uh, engine. Uh, casing there, and you took a screwdriver, you could just go beep, right between on that bulkhead. You could punch through it, you know, to, with a good jab. So it's not the strongest, it's not like this titanium shield or anything that separates the two wind. Just a, you know, a firewall, uh, just a, a piece of, uh, you know, sure reinforced aluminum shielding, but it's not substantial. So that's what they, they, they cap us if they investigate. And do you I think your left engine was still good at that time? Yes. I personally, yes. I think we set down our personally good motor, but um your when there's very few emergencies that you have to act right now. Okay. Most I and what's funny is by the time I was a lieutenant colonel, 
and you look through the day cut manual and you realize you've been flying the Orient a little while, but you go, oh, man, I've had every single emergency in here. You know, I've experienced <laughs> at least single one, except for this obscure electrical, you know, battery failure or something like that. Planning link failure, you know, fuel, catastrophic fuel leak, you know, obviously engine fires and had to eject, uh, you know, all kinds of problems. All right. And fire is one that you, you don't think about in a second. Most emergencies, you know, I'm flying along at 35,000 feet off the coast of Japan and I get dual bleed caution. And I just said that, I just pulled the engine back a little bit and I said, all right, let's think about this. What's going on? Why am I getting a dual bleed air fit? So I can kind of talk to myself and have a conversation, tell my wing that, hey, knock it off. I got a dual bleed, bleed, uh, one, dual bleed air. Uh, an engine firelight, I don't, it, it's, it's all hands on deck. Start moving your hands and, and make sure you do the procedures correctly. And unfortunately, engine fire left. Bang out. That motor's coming off because I don't want a fire spreading on the aircraft. But unfortunately, you know, we were at the mercy of the, you know, the fate of the, of the fire detection gods or whatever you want to call it. But, uh, they weren't having that thing. I was actually kind of mad. Uh, you know, I always thought, you know, Captain Kirk could get his wing out of anything. <laughs> I was, I was mad when I had to, I was literally mad as reaching down to, I said, I can't believe I'm going to hold this stupid hand. <laughs> no, that's a <pretty> good. <laughs> it was an e-ticket ride at Disney. Fifty. <laughs> Do you have any back or neck problems afterwards or you, you feel like you got through it? Uh, I get a little bit, but, uh, I just had to really, uh, well, I did lose a little bit of height. Okay. I was a quarter inch shorter. <laughs> um, and the flight surgeon who flew out or actually drove, he, the flight surgeon came from Yuma. He drove out to El Centro and met us out there is what ended up happening is, uh, and in Creighton, this was something that tied into the, uh, uh black Hawk thing was Benny and I shell out of this airplane. Of course, the ELTs are going all right, the uh, emergency transport, you know, locator, the trans, they, yes, and in what that going out on guard? Well, it just so happened at that very moment, El Centro, there's a, a UH 60, an army detachment had just been flying out of El Centro and they all left, but they left one bird behind because it had to have some maintenance done. And they had, they were doing some tail rotor balance or something like that, and they're working on it. And they look over and they hear an ELT come over the radios. Just they got the they got the maintenance guys out there and they got the engine turning and they're trying to figure out you know whatever it is that the army guys are doing. They'll, they had a counterbalance on it and they look over and they see a big plume of black smoke right out you know over the horizon right there in the desert you know off El Centro. So they go, hey man, we got you got guys just you know that are you got emergency low you know emergency transmission going on. We got to go do something about this. So they, the maintenance guy strip off the counterbalance and they hop in the, you know, that ELO set the doors and fly right out to us. They just fly to the smoke and then, Oh, there they are right there. And they slide us. And, uh, we were picked up within like six minutes of fetching and <laughs> breath. It was unbelievable. And, uh, so we get a free, uh, helicopter ride. Well, by then, Dash 4, okay, who was our, you know, so we're Dash 3, and our wingman is Dash 4 in the division. Dash 1 and 2 went home. Dash 4 landed at, at El Centro. Uh, Smoke Beidler, who ended up being skipper to the wild line. So he, he lands the plane with his student. They come in, and they find Benny and I, and we're in the infirmary. You know, they're getting us checked into the medical and all this stuff while the flight surgeon's driving out. You got notified from, uh, I think, the El Centro Tower or, or base box. Said, hey, we need a flight surgeon out here. And they came and gave him a physical exam. And he's looking at my x-rays. He goes, yeah. And, and so, mind you, this is May 9th, 2000. So, what am I, 37 years old? Uh, the, yeah, the 37, 38 years old. Yeah, I'm 38. I just turned 30. That's what he goes, hey, see that ghostly 
image down your spine? I go, yeah. He goes, that's arthritis. You know, get used to it. <laughs> like, every male over the age of 35 starts developing arthritis of the spine. Some worse than others, but insure it up and see it. But yeah, it, I haven't had any significant back or neck problems. I just have to, uh, I had to make sure that I, I kept the, my core strength good and everything so I don't get a sore back because if I don't, I, I will start to get well, that's some nasty pain sometimes. But other than that, it's management. Now, my biggest deficit coming out of the military was my loss of hearing. Tinnitus <laughs> and all that stuff. Hey, sir, did you ever serve with uh, Snake Dalton or Badger on it? I did. Uh, Badger <laughs> and I are pretty good friends, uh, by the way. I visited Badger when he was stationed in Hawaii. Uh, yeah, we and Keith and I went out. We were just hanging out at his place. Then we went uh, played around on uh, the North Shores at Hawaii. This is when they were at K-Bay. And then... Uh, Got to see Badger a few times when he was with Top Gun out at Miramar. Uh, I remember a funny story about Badger. He wanted, he always wanted to do what he called the uh, the Clutch Back Cam, but she never got it. Hopefully, it's the two years current. And back then, Top Gun was flying the A4, I uh, think the A4M. They had the F16 and the F18, and he was current in all three. And he wanted to do a, a one day of his life where he took off in the morning and threw one aircraft, took off midday to the other, took off in the afternoon, third, so he could fly three. Many days he would fly two missions. He'd do one air, you know, out of F 16 into a Hornet, out of the A 4 into the, uh, you know, F 16, et cetera. But he never got the trifecta and he always kicked himself. Man, I wish I would have got that. But uh, yeah, he ended up flying uh, airlines uh, and he got out. And uh, sounds like you're. Would you ever? Well, yeah, I served with the Vikings and the Green Knights. So, oh, oh Nate Dalton was my was my skipper. Okay. And then Badger was just kind of a base legend. Him and Snake would go at it, and they're kind of legends for BFM throughout the Marine Corps. So I wondered if you ever, if you ever fought him. No, I never got to fight Badger. I fought um, one of his squadron mates, uh, Riff Raff. Uh, Riff Raff came back through when I was an instructor. So, yeah, the peer group was Snake Dalton. He would have been a lieutenant colonel when I would have been a captain. Just to kind of give you an idea, peer group wise. So I was a few years behind him. Uh, but I knew Jay before, because even back when I was an air support patrol officer, I knew a Jay out at Miramar because uh, a friend of mine that I went to school with here in Tucson and grew up with ended up going into the Lancers with Riff Raff and Badger and Skull, Troll, Minucci, all these you know, famous names that uh, I ended up recycling and recirculating through and meeting all these guys. And, and it, you know, Marine Corps is a small world, uh, as you well know. So, uh, that's how I got to meet Badger. And then uh, one of his squadron mates at the time was Riff Rap. And he, he came back through. He went back to D.C. I think he did a you know, Pentagon tour or headquarters Marine Corps tour or something. Came back as an 05. And he's getting a refresher to get back in the cockpit again. So I'm going to be his instructor. And uh, he and I got to go out and get to go hanging it up with Riff Rap. So. Yeah, it was uh, it was fun. That's pretty cool. Oh no, yeah, Snake was. That's when I was with the Vikings when he took over. That was probably our most fun. Uh, so the one fact that we did the Pacific Island hopping stuff. Yeah, yeah and exactly. I think he's that out of Old Coral. No, that was at Miramar. So when I got there, yeah, I I, I checked in uh, the same day as the last Hornet. Was uh, it, the last one it made by Boeing was made uh, or landed because then they started making the supers. So it's like 2001 sometime. Gotcha. I think it was around 2001, 2002. Snake took over, skipper for Vikings. And then 
we did the fish hook island hopping campaign, which is a ton of fun. And, but I, I just, the, the whole base, all the, you know, all the pilots from all over would always talk about when there's even Navy pilots and Air Force pilots that talk about Snake and Badger and Fighter Pilot Podcasts. They, their names come up. They've never been interviewed. I, I talked to Snake not too long ago. He's worked, he's with Jet Blue. He, and he did say that he would talk a little bit about Badger. I think Badger was from San Diego, right? He's kind of a surfer guy, right? <laughs> and then became a Hornet, a Hornet driver. But it's just kind of fun to hear a story from other people's perspective, of, uh, you know, flying with those guys from the past. I only knew them as, you know, Lieutenant Colonel. Now, Jay, you know, Badger was, he was really good. He, he was a great BFM. And he was like, like you say, he was like the BFM at top, no less. And, you know, the, he said, yeah, so it's so went out. And they tried to show me something. And again, I, I put a bit to it. Where things that you put us, and he would just talk about it. Uh, he was like, yeah, I mean, he made a something where we went nose down and put him out. Yeah, there's one of the, we'll have to find it, but it, it's, it's a Navy Tomcat Top Gun instructor talking about how good he was. And he's telling, uh, who, who does the whole thing for that? Bone, uh, part of the podcast. What, what's his name? Jello. Jello, yeah, Jello. So Jello's asking him and say, so he's like, yeah, I was taking all these guys out. He's like, so that's time to fight the Marines. And he's like, well, who do you want to fight? He goes, I don't care. Just give me your best guy. And they're going, are you sure? But yeah, just I don't care. Just give me your best guy. And so they put me up against this guy named Badger. And I'm like, Badger? The name is that. And he just mopped the floor with me. <laughs> because he was killing everybody. And then he fights Badger and Badger just like nothing. Basically, he said it was it was just a huge, humbling experience for him. Like there, he just didn't couldn't believe that. Badger could do what he could do. And I'd heard that, that those guys could do things in a harness that a lot of guys would say that that's impossible. How can you do that? How can you be up that high? Just things like that. Like they knew the jet so well that they could do things that was like, how, they couldn't, it was, they couldn't think about how, how was that physically possible to do that in the harness? That's, that's, uh, Badger was more real than he, he really attuned to that BFM. So yeah, that's neat. Yeah, Becker's kind of a quiet guy too. Uh, I I suppose if I reached out now, I could get in touch with them, and you know, all he'd want to do is just you know go have dinner, you know, talk about what his kids are doing and stuff like that. You know, yeah. Well, we'd love to have him on if you can convince him. Out. Snake's going to come on at some point. He's just busy. Well, they're both pretty busy with flying, right? Uh, their schedule with uh, the airline. Oh, you know, yeah. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Charles, did you did you ask the question that you wanted to ask? You didn't want, you didn't know if it's uh, going to get answered. Oh, it was the ejection. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's embarrassing from the standpoint of I have logged more takeoffs than landings <laughs> in my flight log. Oh, yeah. The, well, I mean, you know, you had you had two pilots land separately that flight, so you could count it that way. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, <laughs> and the the funny story behind that is everything was done electronically back then. So when you came back and you typed in your uh, you know your nav flare, uh, you had to. You know, you put in your takeoff time, uh, land time, takeoff location, what kind of approach you did, if you did an approach, what kind of landings, you know, day, night, et cetera. Well, I got back and they, the maintenance uh, chief, uh, you know, uh, Master Gun says, uh, sir, you got to finish an nav flare. I said, you got to be kidding me. He goes, no, sir. He goes, that's just, we got to at least close the loop on this flight, even though the plane is destroyed and it's, you know, buried in the desert and it still is to this day they could not recover the entire airframe including the, the hud tape and all that but anyway uh so i went to the computer and i took i said okay well i let's see may 9th but took off from miramar and x whatever the 
four letter identifier is enough at this time, 1700 land time. Well, let's see, it was about 45 minutes into the flight. Okay. So I put a land time and then it says type of landing. So I went to the, I, it was all drop down menu. So I went to the Harrier section and picked day vertical landing. <laughs> I, and, and I logged that if I logged that. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. It's going to help you said visual approach. Yeah. Yeah, we were VFR the whole time. So visual, they, they, you know, they vertical in. That just sounds good to me. And, it, and I, they say in the Navy, they say in the Navy, you, you can't be a, an admiral, an aviator admiral if you haven't injected. Because a bunch of them have. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now, if, what's kind of scary, you know, when you do the, if you look at, the, like, if you were an actuarial and you did the real hardcore bean counting, um, if you are involved in a significant mishap like that, and I think I was, I was like right at the, when I pulled the handle, I was just over a thousand hours in cockpit in the Hornet at the time. The odds of you having another significant event like that go up, and they, it's, and they don't know. You know, they were doing all kinds of studies on it and everything, but it, it's kind of like, hmm, somebody's got your number, you know, and it ain't you. And <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all right. Well, I, I tell you one thing: when I had my catastrophic fuel leak, uh, it was post ejection, you know, flying time. I took off out of uh, Karat, Thailand, and what had happened was the main fuel line coming up the the pump you know, from the fuel cell into the engines decoupled, and right after I got wheels in the well, and I'm just pouring gas out the belly of my airframe, like, and I'm watching my gas gauge just count down. I realize I have to get this plane on the on the ground right now. And I'll be darned if I'm going to pull that ejection handle. <laughs> and so, yeah, some, somebody should speak to the AMO about this, I think. That's right. Yeah, with a double AMO especially. Yeah, at, at, the, uh, at the time, I was the uh, XO. And uh, so I just literally got my gear up in the wheel wells, recognized what the problem is, and I just turned down, dropped my landing gear, and was, I'm just pouring gas all over the countryside of Thailand and then just turned around and landed. It was the shortest flight in my career. And by the time I rolled out to the end of the runway, I had about a thousand pounds, 1500 pounds. That's it. And that jet shuts off at what? 500 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, uh, we were slick. So we were at about 10.0. So, so uh, they, so you'll you'll be pleased to hear that in DCS, if you if you get shot by as much as an AK forty seven with one bullet, you experience like the exact same thing. No, <laughs> catastrophic fury every single time, pretty much. The, yeah. the damage model is a little bit too uh, too coarse for that. Yeah, the, any any shrapnel hits you, you're almost certainly bleeding all of your fuel out. Well, I suppose the golden BB works in the fuel line too, but typically you get hit the fuel cell. Uh, it can withstand that. Uh, it's supposed to be self sealing and, you know, survivable, but, you know, then again. Yeah. That, <laughs> this is one of the things that's not quite finished enough. There, there, are, there are other jets that have better, more granular damage model. I was just going to ask a very quick follow up question to, to the uh, ejection um, scenario as well. Um, you mentioned, you know, obviously you, you're seeing the jet below you. Is it is it really difficult to steer the the emergency chute? Um, no, no. But so uh, that, is, and is is it is it um, is it slow enough to to prevent in injury, or is it really small and and you really hit the ground hard? Well, uh, get on your roof, with your one story out, and jump off. Is it? That's about what it what it's like. So if you're not careful, you can really mess up your leg or hip or ankle or something. So they, but lucky for us, we're over the desert. Uh, what was funny is because we had a few, a couple of minutes of, of uh, rest and relaxation <laughs> in our spa on the way down, 
Um, I'm just trying to follow him, Ben. Okay, because where he lands, I want to land so I can get to him as quickly as possible. Make sure that and do have each other check each other out. Make truly because if when you're in shock like that, you know your bone could be sticking out of you. you know. So as we're descending down, I can kind of feel a little bit of a westerly wind pushing us, and the bombing facility was right along a canal, and on the other side of the canal, outside of the bombing facility, is lush farmland, a bunch of big acre, you know, millions of acres of alfalfa fields. And I'm going, desert? Darren, I'm going for the farm. So I start steering for the farm. And about 30 seconds later, I'm looking and I go, well, I, I, I'm going to clear the canal if I want to, unless I steer back into the wind and let's stay right real close to Benny. And I, I was funny to, you know, like thinking maybe if I could coach Benny to, hey, go to the <laughs> soft green stuff over there instead of the hard desert because there's rocks and stuff over there. Is, well, Benny's just kind of tracking due north and I'm tracking like north northeast on my descent. All right. And then I look and I see cows in the pastures. <laughs> and then I think where there's cows, there's a bull. <laughs> okay. And I said, nah, I'm going for the desert. The last thing I you know, wanted was the headlines. You know, pilot survives ejection, gets gored by Brahma or something. <laughs> I feel like that. I was maybe overthinking these. Uh, I just said, you know what? I'll leave cows alone. And so I then it's it, it, Yeah. So, Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's just, I was just curious if it, if it was, you know, easy to steer and, and but yeah, sounds like, sounds like you have pretty, pretty yeah. good control. Yeah. If the winds aren't out of, out of, uh, out of, you know, limits, it's, it's very steerable. Uh, surprising. Uh, I became a parachutist. If the life of action steer left and right, where I landed to go, uh, within reason. Uh, and got me, you know, to land on some, get some sand out there. And... You ever, jump some... of... ever jump out of a plane since, or did that scratch the oh, no. <laughs> no. Take that. <laughs> I have no desire to be at an eagle. Or... <laughs> I've heard some stories of other people that have had to uh, punch the canopy and eject in situations like that. When it happened to you and you had that, that engine blow out on you, Mm -hmm. uh, the other people that have had ejections said the time seemed to really dilate when that happened. And yeah. a second felt like an hour. Did you notice that time shift when you're, when you suddenly realized like, oh crap, I'm, I'm in a dangerous situation. I remember it didn't seem like, a, you know, the split second didn't seem like an hour, but I do remember minute details that when I showed up for work. So what happened? I think that was a Thursday when I shelled out. I'd have to go back and look at my calendar of eight night um, the 2000. What you know, there's people who could do that in their head. But I got back from El Centro the next day. The skipper said, see you next week. And I got back and I walk into my office on Monday morning. And there's a civilian clothes gentleman sitting in my chair. Uh, excuse me, can I help you? Uh, it was a gentleman from England to present me my Martin Baker full board because <laughs> Annie and I were number 16 and 17 to successfully, you know, shell out with a uh, SJU at C. And he gave me the you know, Caterpillar, Lifetime Caterpillar Club and all this dumb stuff. So anyway, what he was there for was to thoroughly debrief me on the, just the ejection sequence itself. Because Martin Baker takes, you know, real detailed notes because they're always trying to improve their product. Matter of fact, I gave him some ins insight to underneath the seat, there's a thing called a kicker rocket, kicker motor that impulses you left or right. So, to, you know, Back seat first, front seat second, you know, back seat left, or front seat right, I believe, is the way that it rocks. So you come out not only separated, you know, longitudinally, but laterally. So but to maximize the 
opportunity to miss each other. Because uh, the last thing you want is me to separate from my seat, that my seat was smashing right down into the NH, something that day, that thing. So he takes detailed notes, and I describe things that were happening from the time I pulled the handle and what I heard, what I saw, and everything. And he given when he was all done, he says, Okay, that time from handle pull to this event that you remember? I said, Yeah, he goes, That was 0.8 seconds. You know, I had him write about her, you know. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, your brain does something there. And I uh, know that instinct to survive and all that other stuff, you know, goes up full alert. Uh, so, yeah, that was that was kind of interesting. Have you had a situation like that since then? No, nothing, nothing close to that. Yeah. How would, well, you know, you want to talk about, uh, uh, a full cavalcade of emotion just crammed into about a second and a half, you know, it's, you know, and then of course you have the physical aspect of it too, physiological. So yeah, it's a uh, pretty exciting. Thank you. Yeah. You, you said May 9th, May 9, 2000. It was a Thursday. Okay. Look at that. Oh, and see would. Eh. Memory serves me correct. I'm I'm sitting here with a calendar on my computer. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, so remember that day like it happened yesterday, which is bizarre. There's a few days like that I had. Even there are certain flights, certain missions I did, and everything I could still remember who I flew with. Then what happened? What time they took off? You know, all the weather was like. It, certain things stick out like that. I, I I can't be the only one noticing here, but we we've had conversations with uh, you know our pilots um, before, and I I'm gonna have to say your recall of the detail uh, of the various systems, and you know you were talking about exactly how things work, and it is is very very impressive, and uh, uh, you know compared to to some of the other pilots we've spoken to who. Are you know barely ten years out of uh, their career, and they're like, oh, yeah, I can't remember that." <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, I uh, well, thank you for that uh, compliment. But I uh, uh, just give me some time. I'm getting older, so it's to wear off. <laughs> but um, the it, when you have an affinity, a love for flying and aviation, it's not just a job; it's something that you really love. I mean, Creighton will tell you about it because I'm still here, 61 years old, building F-18 mod, uh, scale model kit. You know, kind of like you guys are like the, the flying aspect of it. I like that part too, but I also like the aesthetics of it. So my whole life was like just, you know, and so as I'm going through my career, I'm just absorbing this stuff. I think it, and I'm just eating up. Well, and it's, it's not that it became like a an idol for me, but I really cherished it and I really paid attention and uh, I really liked it. But what I always did be, and it, what helped was becoming an instructor. If if, don't, if you're kind of weak in a subject area, try teaching, <laughs> and you'll find that you have to dig really deep, be able to present the material to somebody, and especially somebody who doesn't get it. Who maybe doesn't understand it, you have to learn. Okay, maybe I should come at it from a different way and it be to map what it. That's, it was, uh, if you can do that with any any subject matter, uh, it really gives you a, a stronger appreciation for it. So that now, admittedly, uh, you know, I I can remember things from my childhood with extreme detail, you know. Little League baseball games, what the count was, and who the team was, if you're playing, who the coach was, who was on second, you know, what's on first, oh wait. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it just, so I uh, I think I was gifted with a, a good memory with some of the detail type of thing. And then I'll forget where I make clue. Did all, but bad, you know, like all of us, but that's I called dementia. I remembered. Yeah, I can still remember just, you know, flying, you know. Fun as ten years. People uh, interacting, things that were said, uh, you know, it, it, the 
Yeah. I guess uh, different folks have different capacity for that or, or I don't know if it's a capacity or if it's a, uh, maybe a, an attitude of, well, I, I just don't care about that anymore. Great core doesn't write me paychecks anymore. So what do I care? Well, no, actually I, I, for some reason it's stuck in here, you know? Oops. So speaking of things stuck in there, what at what point in your pilot career or maybe even in your instructor career as you were going through it, did you hit that point where you kind of stepped back and said, wow, this is really cool. Like I might have made it. Um, I was riding a bicycle to work one morning. Look, uh, the affectionately called a Binjo Bobber. Over in when I was stationed in Japan, and these big, ugly looking bicycles that you could buy for, you know, five bucks from previous pilot, you know, previous squadron that was there, you would get it from everybody passed down the same bikes, the same cars. It was kept them going. I'm driving, riding a bike to work because, you know, I could, and uh, I don't need to use the, the automobile because every year, right on base there at Yuwakuni, and uh, it was a muggy. Uh, like, I mean, first part of summer, muggy morning, kind of warm, and I'm on a bicycle, and I said to myself, I can't believe I'm getting paid to be, I really can't. And I mean, I was, again, I said, I, I can't believe some, you know, something went wrong in the universe. <laughs> okay. Stars misaligned, and they decided to let me do this job and to get paid. For. Yeah, I really, I knew that it was, Wow, this is a lot of fun, and I should, you know, really, you know, appreciate it. God, it's not surprising that you immediately knew what that one was. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> no hesitation. Yeah, I was riding a bike when I was in Japan. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Well, I, it's because I think that it was that emotion I remember. Oh wow, this is. It was like a um, uh, like a. It was like all of a sudden I put things into perspective, and I said, you know, here you are this butthead captain riding in a flight suit on a bicycle uh, so with a goofy helmet on going into work and you're going to go fly an F-18 to play. This is too fun. Yeah, we've, we've got a guy in our squadron that uh, was an F-14 Rio and is currently a SEM instructor at Pensacola in a T-45. And he says, they pay me to get up early in the morning so I'll do everything else for free. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, I parked the bike and, uh, you know, I'm walking in and I'm met by my gunnery sergeant and he tells me about what happened on Liberty last night. And then reality sets back. <laughs> right. Now we got to take care of the Marines. <laughs> Go get in trouble. We got to give, you got to disclose. It's called Ward's presentation later on today. And I got a counseling session with, you know, staff sergeant, the uh, Voight or whatever later on. So then, okay, now real work starts happening. Yeah. <laughs> How cool. No. All right. It's yes, maybe my second part. We've been uh, yapping on the dish. It's been here for quite a while, haven't we? I'm just waiting. Yeah. It's been, it's been a two, two hours, 15 minutes thereabouts. I think, it, no, I, I think it's been one hour. It's just the time dilate in this. Time. <laughs> Glad to know there were a traumatic incident you have to remember, Patrick. Appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> We're all going through it. <laughs> all right. Um, any other questions? Yeah, there's 20 years in the Marine Corps, and, and Craig, you can attest to this. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the stories of the things that happen to you on a day-to-day -day basis, people you meet, and the things that you find. But, but we could... This could be a, a year long series, you know, every, every, uh, you could talk another, uh, you know, another aspect of so, something that happened at, you know, boot camp or office of Canada school, you know, or, you know, just prior to retirements or, you know, let's go run the gamut, all the different things you have to think this, yeah, it was a life, a lifetime crammed into 20 years, you know, it's amazing. I'll send a laundry list of questions. <laughs> about various pilots like Buck Gardner and <laughs> Smokecraft and all. I'm sure you know a ton of these guys. 
I've heard, yeah, so, so these names are starting to ring a bell. Now, I didn't necessarily fly in the same units with those guys, um, but we all knew one another, you know, vicariously through either the rumor mill, word of mouth, or bumping into them at the club or something like that. And then, obviously, if you get to fly a mission against them or with them, you know, you're in a brief together or something. So, so yeah, there's uh, there's quite a few names out there that uh, I have some some fond memories of. That's cool. Thanks. Yeah. We definitely appreciate your time today, and for for those of us that, that never served or never got to do it, it's it, the DCS is kind of a cool way for us to kind of live vicariously through some of that, and you know, still feel like we can relate a little bit. So appreciate your service. Thank you for that, and thank you for your time today. It's been really awesome to sit down and pick your brain. Absolutely, it's been my pleasure. Appreciate the the question and the uh, the attentiveness. This has been uh, a lot of fun chatting. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Yes, thank you. Thank you if you ever wanted to watch one of our off nights. I think you'd be <laughs> take a spectator seat to it or something and see the badness unfold. Yeah, it's all us. I'll do the. Uh, what I'll do is, yes, I can. I'll we'll we'll work it out. I'll, I'll get a camera in my house and I'll project the screen and I'll put my silhouette in front and I'll do the mystery science theater three thousand thing <laughs> and I'll be making smart aleck remarks. <laughs> and, and the cascade goes down and you'll just hear me going, "Hey, what's this guy doing?" <laughs> we do that on Ox anyway. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. Every Oxcom is just a peanut gallery. So face for nothing going on. No, it's got to be that way. You have to. You got to. You got to rib one another and, and push each other. That's what the cures are there for. Very quickly mentioning, uh, one of the guys had mentioned uh, the guy who's actually doing flights and uh, his call sign in the in the squadron is Millie. And one day we were just doing a fun flight, and I was actually the pilot in the fourteen, and he was the Rio again. And as we're, we're taxiing out of, I think we were like simulated in Syria. Even on the taxi, he's in the back seat going, just ban. This is bringing back some memories. <laughs> and it was probably the most terrifying experience I had ever had in DCS because I have a real world F 14 Rio in my back seat walking me through everything. And I'm like, I, I can't even taxi straight. <laughs> I think any one of us would have an absolute blast. You came and flew with us one night. Oh, I'm pretty sure if I got on your computer, I'd be all thumbs, you know. But... <laughs> I'd be a whole other place because, you know, I can still remember, you know, all the, the mechanics of the real thing. But I, again, I haven't uh, played on the computer or done any of that stuff. So I've, I've seen guys with the full cockpit mock-ups and the, all the inputs uh, with literally the ergonomics are set up. Got a couple of them in the squadron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you're, you're right there with me. I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. How pancake. The guy has an entire room that's just, it's an F-18 cockpit when you walk in. It's insane. Yeah, my experience with computer games is uh, got a mouse. Uh, I got some NES <laughs> down there. Nope. Got an alt button and a Q and a T. So yeah, I, so, yeah, some of the stuff I, I can imagine with those on, uh, it, it, would take me, uh, it would take me a long time to get that learning curve up to be able to start, uh, you know, competently uh, performing. It might be fun. Yeah, that's that's the, the 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 big difference between what you did and what we do is we're all IFR pilots. You're you yeah. you've got we we don't have the seat of the pants feel that 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 you had in the real thing. So yeah. I think and I and that's one of the things that I think we've all heard from actual pilots doing you know playing the game is is they can't feel the jet, so it's it's it seems harder for them because you know, yeah. Well, that's. That's something you can definitely know, uh, and I know we're wrapping things up here, but when you flew the simulators, that they had the full off mock simulator with the F-18, it felt unnatural. It felt very awkward to get in there and do an instrument check ride in a simulator. Because it was moving the throttle, and you're not hearing anything, you're not feeling anything. It's just, you're just looking at instruments that you're just looking at the video display screen you know and it was you know quite involved but still it's just it just wasn't yeah but once you get used to that environment that uh everything else these comes people aiming at fine you know it's just unnatural
Well, Pig, uh, we re- really appreciate you uh, coming out and talking with us this and uh, suffering through our all our questions and, and whatnot. Oh, uh, well, this has been a good audience. Really good. This has been a good uh, little chat group here. I like it. Yep. Uh, we've had we've had uh, Sluggo on here a few times. Maybe we'll uh, we'll bring you back in and and uh, sometime in the future and, and and do it again if you're if you're up for it. Okay. Yeah. Tex is doing a little preview on his. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's there's uh, there's Tex's uh, cockpit on the cockpit. Jaw. There it is. Look at that. Nice. Got um, two DDIs and MPCD that front control. Yep. Right. I'm getting, I'm getting there. All out there. That's, it's looking very much like a hornet. I'm getting there. He, I, I started before him, but he, he progressed faster than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say it was in the, in the meantime, since I get, I've got names and faces now, uh, with this little, uh, time we've had together, I'll, I'm going to start watching uh, and learning a little bit more about what you guys are doing on your little DCS clips uh, that you're that you're doing great. Your Bond seventeen seventy five, uh, yes sir, uh, channel. And uh, so now I'll keep an eye out. Uh, now, does everybody have a call sign? The only call sign I see is pull up. Yep, we all got them. <laughs> we we all have them. I'm Bones. Bones. <laughs> Pegasus, cyborg, cyborg, Gar- I'm there. And, and let's see, John. What was your call sign again, John? Dex, Dex. And I right. oh. somebody said something was cut up. Ben, what's yours? Mine is Merlin. Merlin. Oh, okay. That's a fun one. It said. And Chris, I don't know if Chris is here, but Chris is laser. Laser. Yeah, we just, we typically just let people narc. when they join, pick their first one, and then some squadrons more so than others will kind of dull out new ones as needed. So, yeah, that uh, well, eventually, you know, maybe you've been introduced to the kangaroo court. Yes, they have. <laughs> Designation of the, the call sign. You typically earn your call sign. So I'll let you all guess how I earned pig. So, well, we know it wasn't by landing in a farm full of pigs. So <laughs> that had nothing to do with the, uh, with the, uh, well, is it an acronym? <laughs> no, no, it's not an acronym. It's regarding that, that barnyard animal. <laughs> Oh, no, we can leave that for, uh, for that discussion. <laughs> the good. Good. Right at home, DCS <laughs> does have cows you can put in the field. Oh, <laughs> Just don't fail <laughs> out. Don't bail out over a pasture full of cows. This is going to be a bull. It's, it's got your name. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Something to start uh, the second episode on. Uh, if you ever would like to come back, we would love to have you back. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. A little, uh, lots, uh, lots of good questions today, too. It'll get progressively worse. Don't worry. <laughs> but I tell you, some of the questions you get asked when you're out standing next to an airplane at an air show, you know, <laughs> just, your your questions are much more in depth. Listen, on the point of what really goes on in the you know the flying community, you know, the mission and all that kind of stuff. So. It's not pointing at a pedo tube and asking, is that a gun? <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Fanny. Mm. That's uh, when, you, they they do. when I think back to the time I was on a bike, I said, I can't believe it. <laughs> 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 it's our Dr. Evil laser beams. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts. I like it. I want them on sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Shotgun. <laughs> That's all right. All right. Well, right. All right. It's dinner time for me, so I'm going to get something to be same here. 
Well, thank Thanks you again. so much. Much appreciated. Yes, thank you again. All right. Yeah, we thank you. <laughs> and is he driving? His headset's dying. It happens all the time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yep. Bye, take two. Take two. Thank you. All right. See you, Crane. See you later, Pig. Hey, X. What flag did you where the heck is there it is yeah oh let's see why am I on push to I am not on push to why am I not oh boy sort of Yes, it is, for whatever reason. I don't know why. It's been audio lock. That one, damn good. How about now? There we go. Thank <laughs> you.